From the number one station, this is a story about love. A love story. <laughs> music is love. And love is music.
From the number one station, this is a story about love. A love story. <laughs> music is love. And love is music. Yo, 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 what's up everybody? Welcome to the Fruitful Investing Show. Give me a quick shout out in the chat that you can hear my audio before I start rolling. I need at least one thumbs up, at least one. And I know I'm good, because I'm just gonna sit here and start rambling. We're good? We got the good audio? All right guys, welcome to the show again. I'm just gonna do a quick little presentation on how I find private sellers, how I find flip properties for about 10, 15 minutes while some more people log on, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. So a lot of you guys are always asking me, 
How do I buy flips? How do I even get these crazy deals? Because right now in Southwestern Ontario, in the majority of North America, the guys ain't getting really good flip deals off the MLS. We used to be able to do that four or five years ago. Now it's like almost impossible. All the flips must be off market so we can actually go direct to seller and get a better deal and take out those dang realtor fees. Even though I'm a realtor, I know we can't pay them to get good deals. So before I even get into this, as you guys know, buy and hold real estate is the real deal. That's what I want you guys to really, really focus on first. And then once you actually start, I always say, once you have like a $2 million net worth from the buy and holds, that's when we go into the flipping properties. Although I know some of you are gonna ignore me and be like, no, I wanna do flips right now. I don't care, I only have one property or no property. So I might as well teach you how to do it properly because flips is a veteran investing strategy. I always say that. And if you wanna do flips, you gotta know exactly what you're doing because you can lose your shirt really, really bad, but you can also make a crap ton of money. So number one, how do I even find these private deals? How do I get these sellers to even contact me? Number one, you need to have a website. So like you've seen them all, right? Like the We Buy Houses website, We Buy Kitchener Waterloo Houses. In fact, my website is ibuykitchener-waterloohomes.com. You can go check that out if you wanna copy my shit and steal me, I'm giving you permission, go check that out. But you need a website and why? Because we need to show like past flips. Just so, I'll tell you why in a second, but this is something that we can show the sellers and it just gives you more I don't know, what do you call it? Authority, when they go visit your website, they're like, yeah, man, this guy or girl knows what they're doing. They've bought deals in the past. I can probably trust them to sell my house. So we wanna show our past deals on a website and also we wanna get testimonials. Very, very important and very tough to get a testimonial from a private seller, but if you give them a good deal or like help them with their problem, asking them at the last second, hey, can I do a quick little video with you? I'm gonna ask you three questions about your experience with me, bust out the iPhone, just do a quick little video. That's what I did. And those work really, really well because then other people see that and go, well, they trusted them and it worked out. Maybe I can trust them too. So a website is a very, very big importance because a lot of wholesalers in the area are just sending flyers out and all this marketing with only a phone number uh, attached. So that's not enough. Like you really need to stand out because everybody has that. Everybody has a phone number that they can call. Nobody actually has like a website with all the details on it. Once you do that, once you have a website, number two, how do we actually get them to call us? One of the best ways or one of my favorite ways is sending out flyers. Now, this one, you have to send out like a massive amount. Like a minimum that you should send out for like a trial run should be at least 10,000 flyers. Now that's gonna cost quite a bit. Um, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how much I send out because there's a lot of you who might be in my area or in Southwestern Ontario trying to come to Kitchener, you ain't gonna get it. I'm not telling you what I do. What I will say is I send out enough flyers that don't even bother. And that's, that's what you wanna be. Like you wanna be the authority in your city to the point where other wholesalers are like, oh, let's go to John or Sarah's city because they're killing it on whatever. Don't even bother, man. Like I'm sending out so many flyers and spending so much money marketing don't even bother. So that's the really, that's the point you wanna to get to, but a minimum is 10K. Now, why I say that is I used to send out like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, cause I'm cheap, man, I'm the fruitful investor, AKA the frugal investor, I'm cheap. And it just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to like penetrate and get uh, leads in, cause flyers are kind of cold leads. They're just cold. You're sending them out to everybody and anybody, hoping some people call back um, and get some deals from you. But it is a very, very important strategy that you must do. So the more, the better. I hate when people say this, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. But <laughs> off-market deals is literally a numbers game. The more marketing you send out, the more deals you'll get back. That's just kind of how it works. The other kind of con for the flyers is that it costs a crap ton of money. Like I said, the 10K flyers, if you're doing Canada Post in Ontario, let's say, you know, the 10K flyers is probably gonna cost you about, eh, if you're getting a good deal, about 300 bucks just for the flyers for the 10K, and you're gonna spend probably about another 1100 with Canada Post to send out those 10K, give or take. So we're talking about at least 1300 to 1500 depending on the mail out. Um, and guys, I send out 10,000 flyers all the time and I get zero back, zero response. And that, that's the worst, right? So that is gonna happen, uh, just be ready for that. But it's very important. The next up is what we do is, what I like to do is the Facebook ads or just PPC, so like Google AdWords. So PPC stands for pay per click. That means like Google ads and a ton of other Yahoo ads, whatever. I f focus a lot on Facebook ads, why? I'm gonna write this right here. It's creepy. 
It's creepy how targeted you can get. So some of the things that I look for, I, I won't write them, it's taking too long. Am I writing a shit, as you guys know? So I'm looking for people who are looking for things on the internet, such as divorce, death, inheritance, financial problems. Uh, what else do I got? I got a lot, of, a lot of stuff on there, but it's very, very targeted. So only those people searching on Google already for things like divorce, inheritance, death, financial problems, they're gonna get my ads only. Whereas the flyers, right, the whole freaking neighborhood gets blanketed and maybe one or two of those people are gonna get my flyer, call me, cool. They go to the website, um, but the Facebook ads are just so targeted. And the more they look at the website, the more it retargets them, et cetera. This might be getting a little overhead for some of you, but that's the kind of the level of stuff you gotta do. So if you want some help on that, we can do some coaching calls, some in-person coaching, hit me up on that. What else do we got? Number four. Oh, so, okay, so this, this is how you get the leads this is pretty much what I do to get the people to at least call me. And again, I'll give you one tip on the flyers right here. You want to have your website on the flyers. Again, most wholesalers don't do that. Why? They don't even have a website. They just have their phone number. If you put the website on the flyer, why that's important is that they can at least check you out because majority of people aren't going to call a number on a flyer, especially a shitty handwritten flyer, right? Or like a shitty crappy flight. My flyer looks crappy on purpose because I'm targeting a very specific type of person, right? Well, I'm not doing color on the flyer. It's not gonna look like a realtor flyer. Why? People get realtor flyers and what do they do? Right into the bin right away, right? Garbage, so we don't want that. We wanna catch them off guard a little bit so people go, what the hell is this piece of crap mail I'm getting? At least they read it and then they can either throw in the garbage or call me. But what I'm saying is they go to the website uh, so they can check me out at least, but when they go to that website, what happens? Facebook algorithm picked up that they went to my website and they're gonna get targeted over and over and over again this is the nerd shit I'm talking about. Very, very nerdy stuff. Very, very important stuff. So this is, this is how essentially I get people to call me. Now, what happens when somebody calls me and it's time to make a deal and they're interested in selling, right? So number four, I'm actually gonna write a little more on this. So what I do is I pre-screen on the phone. So me or my acquisition manager, we pre-screen the people on the phone. And what that means is, well, before people called me, I used to go see all of them. Hey, can you meet me at 12 p.m. tomorrow? I want to sell my house. No problem, I'll be there. I was so excited, right? I would run to the house and what happened? Like 99% of them are a waste of time. Why? They want retail value, realtor value without paying commissions. They just want top value. It ain't gonna happen, bro. I gotta buy it for a good deal and I'll tell you very soon what that formula is on exactly how I buy, but it's a waste of time. So what I do is I pre-screen them and I have a script. It's more so like a questionnaire, really, that I'm just asking them, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's a questionnaire I'm asking them and it's, I won't give that here again. Again, I can't give you everything for free, man. <laughs> Hit me up if you want that. We'll book a coaching call. We'll figure something out. But what I do is I'm just asking them like, hey, uh, why are you selling? Is the property in good shape? Do you think it needs $15,000 worth of work, 20,000, 25,000, et cetera? Every seller is gonna say, no, it's mint condition. Yeah, right, never is. So I'm just asking them basic, basic questions um, to figure out why they're selling. And then near the end of that phone call, on the phone ask, the very first phone call, I'm gonna give them an offer range. Now I'm an expert in my area. I know exactly what the comps are pretty much. As soon as somebody tells me an address and tells me all the details about their house from the questionnaire, I pretty well know what the after repair value is gonna be when I'm done with it. Cause I do so many flips and I'm a realtor in the area. Know your comps, you gotta know your comps and what you're doing. So what I do is I pretty much make them a soft launch offer on the phone. I don't go to the house yet. I want them to accept my soft launch offer. And what that is, is it's a range. So if I know, I'm gonna sell it for 600. I'll get into the formula in a second, but essentially I know that I gotta buy this property for at least 425. Well, like, sorry, almost maximum 425. So I'm gonna give them an offer range of, I have to come see your house first to give you a firm price, but we're gonna be somewhere in the range of 415 to 435. I always give like a $20,000 range just to kind of feel them out. Cause if I were to say 415, they'd be like, yo, get the fuck out of here. If I give them a range, it means that I'm willing to work. I'm willing to, to see exactly and give them as much as I can. That's what it seems like anyway, right? So I always give them a range. Now, if they say, oh, that's way too low. My neighbor next door just sold for 550. There's no way I'm selling for 415, 435. Cool, best, best of luck to you. Click, next lead. I just wait, save myself like two hours of going to the house, meeting the seller, just for him to tell me, my neighbor sold for 550, I need 550, right? It's, it's ridiculous. So that's how this game works. 99.9% .9 of home seller deals, leads that call you, you ain't getting. 
So you need that mentality when you go into this business because it's so goddamn annoying. When you get all these leads, you're like, yes, I'm getting all these leads and they all never work out. Because if you're in a hot market like Kitchener Waterloo, people aren't dumb. They know the values and the majority of people in North America and Southwestern Ontario, which a lot of the viewers here are watching from, people aren't dumb. You need to find the right person who doesn't really care about the amount of money they're getting. They just want their problem solved. So if you can solve that, that's gonna be good, which leads into, okay, finally, we're getting to the point. When I meet them in person, what do I do? Most important thing, you need to be likable. People only do business with those they like and trust. They need to trust you. So what does that mean? We need to be bubbly, we need to be happy. Right? When I go to a seller's house, I'm talking the exact same way I'm doing here. By the way, quick tip, when I go to the seller's house, how do you think I'm dressing? Am I dressing like a fancy realtor with a suit on because I'm a big professional investor? Hell no, I'm wearing this right here. Maybe not the hat, but I'm wearing what you see. This, this is how I dress when I go to the seller's house. This is how I dress anyway as a realtor because I work with investors and who gives a shit. But this is how you need to dress. You can't go there with your fancy watch on. I've got my $100 Fitbit here. Okay, you can't be wearing the Rolex, the big chains. You know, can't pull up in a Lambo. It ain't gonna work. You need to pull up in a shitty Corolla <laughs> wearing this kind of clothes because they need to like and trust you because they don't trust realtors. That's why they called you. They don't wanna work with a realtor. So if you show up looking like a realtor, it ain't gonna go down. All right, number two, I guess here, is to be upfront with what you do and how much money you're gonna make. So again, on that first phone call I was talking about when I, when I talked to them, I tell them exactly what I am. Look, I'm a real estate investor. I can't pay top dollar. I know your neighbor sold for 550. I wish I could give you 550. I'm a real estate investor. I gotta fix your house, sell it on the market. I gotta pay for financing fees. I gotta pay for closing costs, lawyer fees, realtor fees when I go to sell it. So I need to get it at the right price. It has to be a fair investor's price. And look, I'll be really honest with you. It's gonna be less than what a realtor is gonna get you. That's exactly what I tell you, straight up. Look, if you want the most amount of money, you might as well go with a real estate agent. You're probably better off. If money's what you care about, sell it with your buddy Joe, the realtor, because it's not gonna work out between us. When you say that, they're like, holy shit. They get caught off guard, it catches them off, and they might trust you a little more. They'll have more authority. Um, you'll have more authority with them, because it seems like you're in control. And the whole point of this, on the phone call, in the meeting when you're talking to them, you wanna be in control of the whole situation. You're the big guy, you're the big, or the big girl, if that sounds weird. You're the big investor coming here to solve the problem. You need to be in control and they need to sense that you're in control, okay? So be upfront, tell them exactly how much money you're making and I'll get into the calculation of, of how I pitch my offer. And I straight up tell them exactly how much I plan to make as a real estate investor. I might take it down a notch a little bit, maybe five or 10,000 less than what I'm actually gonna make, but I'm pretty well telling them, look, I'm gonna make a good amount of money on here. I'm a real estate investor, I'm solving your problem, this is how it is. Again, they're not expecting that from you. They're expecting some shitty pitch with some listing presentation, with some flip book or an iPad and like realtor stuff. You're not gonna do that. You're just gonna be cool up front. So let's get into the buying formula. That's the most ex uh, exciting thing. I can't even spell buying formula. Okay, this is how you price out off-market deals to flips. And again, this is what I say to uh, sellers exactly. So, this is how we do it. I'll just write the formula out first and then I'll explain it. So we got ARV times 0.8% minus Renos equals, I'll just say price, purchase price that you can pay. So, let's break this down. If I go through a bungalow, which I get a lot of bungalow calls, right? When I'm done with it, new kitchen, new floors, new bathrooms, the way the fruitful investor does it, right? I know the house is gonna be worth 600K. So again, It'll probably be worth 625K in real life, but I'm gonna tell them it's worth 600K. Again, I wanna fudge the numbers a little bit so that because they're always gonna come up in price. The price I give them almost always is never gonna be good enough. It's too low. So when they come up and then, it, you know, if they come up 25 grand more, it feels like they won, but I landed exactly where I want it to be, right? So some little mind tricks here. So anyway, I'm gonna tell them this house I know is worth 600K when I'm done with it. First, sorry, I messed this all up. The most important thing of how we do, first, I'll just go here. I show them a video first. Getting ahead of myself, the script is too blurry. Okay, so when I go through the house, I walk through the house. I walk through, they show me around, I see the kitchen, I see the bathroom, yeah, 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 cool, Mr. Seller. I'm just trying to get them to like me. I'm just talking to them about stuff. My flip chart's falling over. I'm getting them to like me. Um, and then what I do is I show them a video. So I bust out my phone and I show them my last flip which you guys know, if you see my flips, they look pretty good, right? It's pretty fancy, everything's done up really well. So I show them, look, this is the last flip we did. Every single house we do, 
looks the exact same. Your house is gonna look like this. I'm gonna replace the kitchen, I'm gonna do the floors, et cetera, et cetera. Then I show them like the listing video because if you guys are selling properties, you better be doing a listing video. Pictures aren't enough, right? It's 2020. So I, I do a listing video on all my, uh, all my properties. So I show them that, it's about two minutes long, a minute 30 long, I show them the whole video. Reason why I do that and while, while I'm showing them, I'm saying this, you know, you, you see how nice this is? Like this house is really nice, right? And then the seller's like, oh yeah, like that's so nice. You can see I'm gonna do a new kitchen. You can see that all my properties have to look like this. Why? Because this is proven. It's a proven system that I've done with my team. These sell every single time. Now the seller's gonna, gonna say, oh, I know. I just put brand new laminate down two years ago and it's like really ugly, right? I know you did. It, it looks okay but it doesn't look like this. I have to rip them out anyway. Honestly, you might as well not even put the floors down. I know, it, it might as well be trashed because I have to rip it out anyway because it has to look like this. So anyway, I'm kind of beating them down a little bit when they're watching the video, they're like holy shit, like this guy renovates the whole house. My house doesn't look anything like this. So I know his offer is gonna be a little low and I understand why now. That's why I show the video. So I show the video, they're like, man, that house was nice. Now I, I go into this and I, I'm breaking down the numbers with them just as I'm doing with you. Okay, so now you, I've walked through your house, I've shown you the video. You can, when I'm done with it, the house will be 600K, right? I need Tyler here with a calculator. So my man Tyler's behind the screen here because I ain't that good at math. You got the calculator busted out? All right, what's well, 600K? And by the way, I put the calculator right on the coffee table or, the, or wherever we're standing and I do this with them. So, so they see me calculating this in real time. Okay, so I go 600K times 0.8, what does that equal? 480, right? So now they're like, oh, 480. You said 415 on the phone. Uh -huh. Then I tell the seller, oh, so 480, why I do that, Mr. Seller, why I take 20% out of the deal right away is because about 7% goes to financing costs. I gotta borrow money, right? I can't buy every house cash. We're buying three to four houses a month. I have partners, they give me the money. So about 7% of the cost of the deal goes to financing. The other 3% goes to closing costs, holding costs, uh, land transfer tax, lawyer fees, all stuff like that. And then 5% at the end goes to sell the house with the realtors. They gotta sell it and pay 5%. So you can see I have 5% left over. I plan to make 5% on your home, which is pretty much what a realtor makes anyway, right? If you were to hire them at any time. So I'm looking to make what a realtor makes. Now, Mr. Seller, on an average house, I, on this house, I plan to make somewhere between 20 and $30,000. I'll tell them straight up. I'm probably gonna make 20 to $30,000, I hope. Now you've seen all the HGTV shows, it never goes to plan, does it? Sometimes it does, most times it doesn't, but I'm planning to make somewhere around 20 to 30,000. I'll tell them exactly how much I'm gonna make. Okay, so 600K times the 80%, I took the 20% out, now you know why, but I still gotta renovate the home. I haven't even renovated it yet, Mr. Seller, right? So that, this house here, as you can see from the video, this house is gonna cost me about $75,000. That's an average budget for my single family flips, it's about 75K. So I tell them, I still gotta renovate the house, so I gotta subtract 75K, as you see. So that equals, here's my offer, right? 405K. That's it, that's how it works. Now, like I said, 99% of the sellers are gonna see that and go, it's just too low. My neighbor Bob sold for 550, I can't do it. I get it, man, I, I wish I could pay 550. But you can see I have a formula. I have to stick to this formula. If I don't, I lose money, I have a family to feed, right? All the soft stories. I'm, I had to get paid just like you get paid from your job. You can see that I'm only gonna make 25, 30,000 when, when this is all done. It's not like I'm making $100,000 like you see on TV or, or here in all the newspapers. Like it's a, it's, it's a normal amount of money. So the, the thing is, is that 99% of the sellers are still gonna say no, it's too low, no problem. But the reality is they can't get mad at you. They really can't. Now when I used to go through the houses and just give them my, my, my number, I go through, yeah, 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 Mr. Seller, it looks good. Don't show them the video. I didn't have one yet. I didn't show them crap. I would just say, my offer is 405,000. They would say, get the fuck out of my house. Like if I just said it out of nowhere. If I break down the formula, they can disagree with me and say it's not gonna work, but they can't get mad at me and crap talk me on the internet or, or whatever, right? Like they just can't get mad. You can see it's a formula. I gotta follow it. It makes perfect sense. So that's why we do that. That's how I do my pitch. I went to number five. I'll just put five right here. But that's it guys. Let's go over everything real quick and then we'll get into the Q&A, which is the fun part. Hope you guys learned something though. Private sellers, get a website. Very, very important. Nobody has websites, you need one. Once you have a website, flyer the crap out of the areas 
that you wanna target. And if you use Canada Post marketing, it's super cool. You can target the exact neighborhood, the exact streets, it's creepy. I can say I only want semi-detached properties, I only want single family properties, avoid multifamily properties, avoid townhomes. Those are all my secrets of what I do. It's really cool how targeted you can get with Canada Post. I pick all my streets, bang them out. When they get the flyer, they can go to the website. As soon as they go on the website and click, Tyler has got some nerd shit and they start getting the feedback loop of the Facebook ads. It's genius. <laughs> I think it's genius. All right. Once they call you, pre-screen them on the phone first, make sure they're real and actually motivated. Most aren't. They just wanna get around uh, using a realtor and still get full value. Ain't gonna happen, bro. So we want that. Once, you're talking about, once you go to the house and it's, it's actually a deal, you wanna be likable, you wanna be trustworthy, be upfront, tell them everything. Tell them everything on how much money you're gonna make. It's gonna blow them away. Show them a video of a last flip. If you don't have a video, dude, show them my flip and just be like, yo, this is my last flip. It's not, it's mine. It's cool, man, use it all. Um, how do we get to that formula? How do we buy deals to make sure we don't lose our shirts on flips? This is never gonna work on, on MLS. Not in 2020. Don't even try this. You just won't win. You, you can try it, but you're probably not going to win. Okay, so after a pair of value, how much is it going to be worth when you're done with it and it looks dope? Times that value by 0.8% as reason why. We're taking 20% out. Okay, minus the renovations. After you walk through it, you should be able to assess renovations in, in about five or 10 minutes. That's how a pro does it. That equals purchase price. Simple. Boom. Did you guys like that? Comment in the section. Did you guys learn anything? I'm rocking here and my flip chart is about to go for a spill. All right, let's open up the Q&A while I fix this flip chart on live YouTube TV. All right, what's the first question? All right, first question, Dallas Carter. Where do you get your flyers printed, Matt? Dallas Carter, where, where I get my flyers printed. It's a small company here. I'm not even gonna tell you because people, honestly, people on YouTube, man, I know you guys. I'm not even gonna get into it. You guys steal all my stuff. It's cool, I like it, but don't steal my local Kitchener stuff because then I get mad, okay? You can find a bunch of printing companies. There, there's a ton. I'm in Kitchener, Waterloo. I don't know where you're from. It probably doesn't matter what I tell you. This flip chart just keeps going. Basically, just do a, a search on Google, um, flyer printing. There's, there's so many of them. I, I will tell you how much I pay for them so you can know you're not getting screwed. So flyers, okay, for the 10,000, Minimum that, that, that you want to do. And, and by the way, you want to do, the, I'm almost going to tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> almost every week, you'll want to do that. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So the 10K flyers is going to cost you about, if you're with a good printing company, about 250 bucks just for the 10K flyers. And then the Canada Post, as I said, you can't get around that. Like Canada Post is Canada Post. Um, it's about 1100, give or take, from what I remember off the top of my head. What you can do with Canada Post is if you promise and you sign a contract that you're gonna send out a minimum of 100,000 a year, which guys, that's really easy. If you're doing 10K a month, that's it, 120,000. Easy math. You're over the, the contract, super easy to hit. Reason why, with Canada Post, if you don't have a contract, which I did it for the longest time, I just found out about this, which is stupid, but the, what the regular people pay or the sole proprietor businesses is they pay 17 cents. How do I do a cents? There we go. Cents logo. Okay, I think, I think that's right. 17 cents a flyer to drop off. When you do the, when you sign that contract, I said, you pay 12 cents a flyer. Now that makes a big ass difference, trust me, when you're doing 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 a month. That's a big difference in price. So that's what you wanna look out for. 250 bucks for the 10K flyers and that's how much it costs. So if you're gonna do 40,000, let's say you go crazy and you do 10K a week, so you're doing 40,000 a month, you're gonna, I don't know, do the math, man. You're up to like five, 6K a month. That's what you gotta do, man. That's what you gotta do. Is five or six K worth making potentially 25,000 on one flip, right? Think about it. Let's do the easy math. If you send out 40,000 flyers a month, do you on it? And you have the website running and all that, right? So they can go check you out. Do you really think that you can't find one person to sell you a house out of the 40 K? Like the numbers are in your favor, I think. So if, you, if this costs 6K and you're like, oh man, like that's so much money, and it is, man. Dude, I hate spending money and no calls come back. But then the next mail out, you get two deals. And you're like, holy shit, that was wicked, right? 6K a month and on this deal, you're gonna make 25K. Is that worth the trade? It's a profit of 19,000 bucks. I'll do that trade all day long, right? So that's what we're doing. That's the question, that's the answer. Next question. 
thought of not sending out any more flyers since the response rate is so low? The response rate is, the response rate is incredibly high. The time waster rate is also incredibly high. So the lead, the lead, what do you call it? Generation lead conversion is, I wouldn't say low, but it's annoying when you're spending 6K and you get nothing. But the next month, like I said, you get two and then you make 50K. But the flyers are necessary. Why? Because it's a, it's a long-term strategy. So if you do one mail and you get nothing, you're like, oh, fuck flyers. Dude, I did that all the time. Like I was, I've been playing for like two years, just testing the water. And it's only been recently where I'm like, I'm just gonna go balls out like I just said here. I'm just gonna do it and it's working. But when I did 5K here and I get nothing, I'd be pissed off. Two months later, I do 3K there, I get nothing. Oh, screw flyers. It wasn't getting anywhere. Like I said, flyers is a long-term strategy because the majority of the people that actually call me from the flyers have held on to my flyer for two or three months before they even called, right? Maybe they weren't ready then. Maybe they didn't trust me and they kept it on the fridge. I get that all the time. I just called you because I had it on my fridge for like three months and I finally called you. That happens all the time. People want to feel things out a little bit. Maybe like I said, go to the website, check you out. And what tends to happen is when you start committing and sending out all these flyers, 40K, 40K, 40K every month, in the next two, three, six months, you start, you're starting to get like the second wave of all the, the leads coming in and you're still mailing out. So it's just like this continuous amount of leads. So you gotta stick to it. It sucks. You're spending a lot of money to potentially make no money at, at first. And it, what it also does is build authority. Because if you're letting people know in your area what you're doing and they get your flyer the set first time, I don't trust this guy. The second time, I, I don't trust this guy. The third time, the fourth time you come around, they're like, this person keeps flyering me. They must be serious. I've seen this flyer four times. This, this person's serious about buying houses and I wanna sell my house. So again, that's kinda of how it works. It's a very, very long-term strategy, whereas a Facebook is very uh, targeted to someone who's in pain and they gotta sell like right now, right? So both are very, very important. Next question. Next question, uh, Bruno says, any pointers for someone investing in a high-priced area like Vancouver? All right, Bruno said, uh, is there any advice for investing in a high-priced area like Vancouver? So, <laughs> That sucks, kind of, but the biggest thing is, does it work? Does it still work at those numbers? Now, I, I probably, I'm assuming you're gonna say no, because the houses, let's say, it's condo is 750K, probably more, I don't know, Vancouver numbers, and the rent is only 1,500. Like, that's not gonna work, right? Or does it work? I don't know. Is the rent 3,000 on a 900 square foot condo? Like, as long as the numbers work, go for it. So. The thing I like about a high price market, a lot of people would say my area in Kitchener-Waterloo is a high price market. Yeah, it is so because it kicks butt, has fundamentals, job growth, population growth, rental demand, all the things you want in a home, that's why it's high priced. That's, that's what it is. So I wanna be investing in those areas. However, the numbers have to work first and foremost. If they don't work, no matter what, can you do the private deal strategy like I said? It might not work. Or the next thing up is just go to a different city. Like I don't know what to tell you, it sucks. I, I'm, I'll be honest, I got lucky that I, I already live and grew up in one of the best areas to invest in, Kitch or in, in Canada. So I got lucky. I don't have to leave, but I would have to if it didn't work, right? If I lived in Tor downtown Toronto, like you can still invest in downtown Toronto. So I'm assuming you can still invest in Vancouver. It's just harder. And you're probably gonna buy less deals unless you're just hammering the marketing like crazy. So if that doesn't work, you gotta go somewhere else, which unfortunately sucks. But if you're living in Vancouver, there's a ton of other areas that I know of that other investors that I know investing in like Surrey, BC, um, Abbotsford, uh, Edmonton's not too far from you, like next province over. Alberta's next to BC, right? That's sad. I think it is. <laughs> so you want to go over there maybe, right? A lot of investors are going over there. So that's kind of what you have to do. Next question. Kevin asks, have you bought recreational properties as investment rentals? Mm -hmm. Kevin asked, uh, have I bought recreational properties like Airbnbs or something as investment properties? Not me, N not that I wouldn't, but for me, I like boring. You guys already know that. Boring, I'm a pretty boring dude. I like boring and easy, simple. I don't like complicated stuff. So that's not for me because this is it's a very, very active business. I'm kind of like hypocritical here because I have a, a very active flipping business but I know that very, very, very well and I have systems and it just jives with who I am. The short-term rental stuff or the recreation property is not really my thing. I just like boring in terms of long-term real estate and I have fun with the flips. So doesn't mean you can't though. I know so many people that do well with Airbnbs and cottages. Great investment. Just be an expert, know what you're doing. 
You'll do well. It's not for me though. Not yet. Next question. Question is, do you find that seller motivation is changing due to the pandemic? The, the pandemic depends where you are. In my area in Kitchener Waterloo, the answer is no. COVID never happened, man. Not in my area. It did for the first week or two, maybe March 15th to April 1st. People kind of slowed down and stayed in their houses and didn't do anything. Right now, honestly, I think it's right back to pre-COVID, if not even more intense on fire, the market which is kind of normal for spring market, right? We had a late spring market in a sense, but it is absolutely crazy right now. In my area, COVID never happened, right? So depends where you are. If you're in a very small town in Northern Ontario, or I know the uh, middle provinces or uh, out West, much different. They're gonna hit really hard, especially Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, out East too, Newfoundland. Like those guys are getting rocked. P pretty much the only places that aren't hit by this from what I know of, um, is Ontario. So my area is just rocking away. Next question. Question is, do I use hard money loans or private money? So what I do is on the flips, like I was just saying, I do the hard money, which is pretty much, uh, I still don't use banks, not right now. So banks like private lenders that you would go through a mortgage broker to get those private loans for a flip. I'm not doing those either. I only borrow money from investors that I know and that trust me and they know me personally and they live around the area. Why? It's easier with these guys, with the private lending banks, nothing wrong with them. If you have to go there, you, you know, you have to go there. But with these guys, it's, it's the normal bank shit. You got to give your, your credit score. You got to give your T1 general, your NOAs, like all your stuff, your banking statements to prove your income, right? When I get a flip, I call, a few investors that I have, hey, I got this new flip, it's closing in three weeks, I need 400 grand, is that cool? Sure, no, sure thing, Matt, no problem. Click, I got the money. Next couple of days, lawyer gets the money wired to them, that's it, I didn't qualify for nothing. So that's the way I like to go. So I use hard money from essentially friends, or what we'll talk about in a bit, I'm sure, is the branding. I could easily go, and I've done this before, not to brag, but I gotta show you, show you guys what we're doing, but like one time I was looking for private money just to see how much I could raise because I know I'm blowing up the flip business, right? So I just put a call out on Instagram and Facebook. Hey, I'm looking to do some flips. I need some hard money. Who's willing to lend the fruitful investor some money? Guess how much money got theoretically inputted into my <laughs> messenger and Instagram accounts in less than, less than 24 hours. It was well over $2 million. People were saying, Matt, I watch you on YouTube. I trust you. I know what you're doing. I've seen your videos. I trust you. Here's a hundred grand. Here's 30 grand from Bob. Here's 50 grand from Joanne. Here's this, here's that, here's that. When I told it all up, it was well over $2 million. So there, there's so much money out there. It is crazy. We all think that there isn't. There's so much money. People have home or money in their homes and the equity. They make money at their job, they, that, that they're just stockpiling. There's money everywhere. However, the money only goes to people that they trust and like. Like I said, you want to be trustworthy. That's what people do business with, people they know, like, and trust. So you wanna be that person, which is why I'm always hammering down that you guys need to be on social media, shooting videos, doing Instagram posts, following the Fruitful Investors formula. I've, I've done it for 11 years now I've been doing this, and like 10 years on social media back when it wasn't cool. I was back in 2010, I was doing YouTube videos, man, before even YouTube was a thing. That's what it takes. People need to see you have a track record, and then you're gonna have so much money, it's not even funny. So you gotta stick to it. We can help you out with that. You can get my course Unlimited Cash. I'm gonna talk about that later. Or even better yet, if you don't know how to do that, we have a, we have a business, Tyler and I here, my social media guy running this whole thing called Fruitful Marketing. Okay, so we'll do all the marketing for you. We're gonna edit all your videos. We're gonna post them, schedule them, write your blogs, do your podcast. You're gonna be on fire. We're gonna blow your business up if you want. If you're interested in that, hit me up, DM me on Instagram or something. We'll talk about that service. Very, very, very cool for that to get you to the point where you don't gotta ask for money no more. The money's gonna come to you like crazy. I feel like I've been rambling on that for like 10 minutes. I like to ramble. Next question. Uh, Eric Denike says, is there such thing as holding onto a rental property for too long? Do the repairs upkeep to the house start to outweigh the profits at a certain point? Question was, is, is it possible to hold a rental property too long to the point where it starts breaking down and you gotta pay for stuff all over again? It doesn't make sense anymore. I guess theoretically, that's gonna happen, but you can never hold real estate too long. Like never, the longer you hold it, the more money 
you're gonna make. I like drawing money signs, as you see. The more money you're gonna make. So, yeah. So the way I do is when, when we buy a property and close on it, I renovate the whole thing top to bottom on day one. You guys already know that. Why? Specifically because I don't want crap coming down the line when I'm chilling on the beach in Costa Rica. It's the whole reason why I'm investing in real estate. I wanna relax and I want it boring, as I said right here, right? Boring. So that's why I renovate it fully, but theoretically, if you hold it for seven, 10 years, those renovations you did 10 years ago are gonna probably need it again. However, in those 10 years, man, oh my God, you probably made like 200,000 bucks. So if you gotta spend another 20 to freshen it up again, who cares? Let's do it again, let's wait 10 more years, right? Longer you hold real estate, the more wealthy you're gonna get. And that's what the true wealth is, as, as I always say. I like to flip, flipping is cool, flipping is sexy, I get it. You guys really wanna be rich? You guys really wanna be wealthy for real? Stop messing around and buy the long-term real estate. Get your net worth up to a very healthy point, top 1% income in the world. Not very hard to hit, by the way. Once you get that $2 million net worth, then we start, in my opinion, going to the flips, the recreation properties, the cottages, the Airbnbs, et cetera. Why? They're more risky. If you make a mistake in those, you could lose a lot of money. But you, if you have a net worth and you lose 30K on a flip, you know, that sucks, big deal, you'll recover. If you have zero net worth and your first deal ever is a flip and you lose 30K, you'll never wanna do real estate ever again. It's gonna take you forever to get out of that hole working a regular Joe job which I know you guys probably don't want if you're here on the live. What was the question again, long-term real estate? <laughs> I'm rambling tonight, man, I'm in the flow. Yes, long-term real estate, just keep it. Longer, longer, longer is better. Next question. Next question is, uh, what do you think about flipping new builds for income? Question is, what do you think about flipping new builds for income? Okay, so a lot of people do this, and a lot of people I know do this in Vancouver, Toronto, big cities. The reality is, in my mind, what is that? What is that when they do buy a contract and then they sell it as soon as they close or even before? Speculation, you're guessing, you're hoping things work out, you're not actually investing. Now, in the past 10 years, the market's gone up so high and so fast that like everybody looks like a genius when they're doing this. What happens when the market isn't like it is for the past 10 years? That's, that might happen in the near future. Anyway, what I'm getting at is, you're not actually investing because you're not getting mortgage pay down, you're not getting cash flow, you're only betting on appreciation. You're hoping that the price you bought it for, 500 grand for a, a, a condo in the sky in Toronto, and you're hoping in two years when it's actually said to be done, it'll take three, you're hoping it's worth 600. I get the game. And it very m well might do that. It has done that for the past five or seven years at least. However, what if it didn't? Oh man. What if you never even had the money to close on it and it's only worth 500 or even less, 450? Okay, now you're kind of screwed, right? So the thing is, if, you, if, if this scenario happens with a buy and hold, right? I buy it at 500 and I hold it for two years and the whole time, I mean, I'm getting mortgage pay down, it's getting paid down, I'm getting cash flow, so that's a little bit of money there. And in two years, it's still worth only 500K. Did I lose anything? No. I didn't make as much as I wanted, but at least I didn't lose. And what happens if the market does go down? What if it does go down? Now it's worth 450 in year two, my, my rental property for the same price that I actually closed on. Now it's only worth 450 two years later. Did I lose any money? On paper, you only lose when you sell though. So I ain't gonna sell it. So I'm just gonna hold on to it for, an, I'll wait another two years. And then the recession's over, let's say. And then two more years after that, now it's worth 550. Did I lose any money? No, I made a lot of money. Now I've had it for four years and I'm getting cash flow mortgage paid on the whole time. That's why I like the long-term buy and holds better and I don't like that game that much. I'm not gonna say don't do it, it's not smart. I know a lot of people that do do it, but you gotta really know what you're doing and even then you can't really know what you're doing because when it comes down to it, you're just guessing. You're hoping things work out. Don't wanna be the bearer of bad news, but that's just my opinion. Next question. Common types of JVs. By the way, if you guys can hear my dog drinking in the background, that was not me. <laughs> my dog just came in for a run with Rachel, so he's all hot and bothered drinking water. That was not me. Okay, <laughs> JVs, how does it set up? This is how I do it. 50-50 in terms of profits, standard JV, right? It's probably what you're thinking. But what I do is the partner, I'll write, I'll write P for partner, 
they gotta bring all the money, another excuse to draw a dollar sign, and they gotta bring the mortgage in their name. So basically it's the same thing as if they're buying the house on their own. They gotta bring all the money to buy, renovate, close, everything, all the money. And they gotta put the mortgage in their name. Now what happens, I'll put M for me. On closing day, what, what do I do? Everything else, I'm not even gonna write it. I manage the renovation, my personal crew comes in, we renovate it. Once it's all done and nice, I manage the property managers for the next five years, make sure the tenants are happy, I'm, we're getting paid. I'm managing the bookkeeper, the accountant, etc. I'm running the entire business, they're bringing all the money and getting the mortgage, and when we sell the property, we split the profits 50-50. For example, to buy a single family deal in my area, my JV partner, call him Joe, he's gotta put 100K. Joe's gotta put 100K into the deal on average. In five years, we're probably gonna make about, I don't know, 275K in total, but I gotta pay Joe back the 100 that he initially put in, so Joe gets his 100 back, right? Now the 175 is split between the two of us, what is that, 80K? That's exactly, I hope that's right. I'm all confident up here, 80K. Um, essentially, on my JV deals, every five years, my partner and I both make 80K net uh, on the average single family deal. So that's, what, that's the target we're kind of hitting for, and that's exactly how my JVs work. Now, if you're newer, this might not work for you. If you don't have any properties yet, if you only have one or two, and you tell the potential person who's interested from watching your videos, watching your Instagram posts, like I said, and they're like, hey, Sarah, this looks really good. I see your videos, I wanna invest with you. And you say, oh yeah, I have two properties. And they're like, you only have two? Like, I don't really trust you yet. Unfortunately, those are the things that might come up. They did for me, which I'm kind of getting around here. So you might have to do a 30-70 split for your first one or two deals. In order to build your resume, build your YouTube uh, resume, because we always want to do that, like, I always say this, but guys, why do you think I shoot all my before and after videos, right? It's not for fun, right? Me and Tyler have a great time shooting them, but they're really to get JV partners. That's why I do it, man. I don't do it all for fun, to build a resume. So if you can get a couple 30, 70s, they get 70, by the way, you get 30, um, and still the same split. They bring the money, get the mortgage, but they get 70. You're going to get one or two deals from that at the soft launch, you know, of your partnership launch. Um, and then by that point, you have two on your own, let's say. Now you have two with the partners. Now you have four. Okay, who the hell that you know who's average has four properties? Nobody. So the next time somebody messages you on Instagram and says, hey, I saw your sweet videos. How does it work to partner with you? 50-50, bro. And they're like, oh, I don't really trust you yet. I got four properties. They're all kicking ass. I follow the Fruitful Investors formula. The properties look sweet. Um, that's how it works. That's exactly what I did. So I bought two properties by myself. My third one, exact same thing happened. Matt, I saw your videos. It looks like what you're doing is kicking ass, but you only have two. I don't really trust you yet. Um, no problem. I'll take 30, you take 70. That's how we did it. On the fourth one that came along, no, 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 bro, 50-50. And now it's not even a question. I get the 50-50s all the time because we got all the videos, we got the resume. That's how it works. All right, next question. I feel like I'm answering these questions long tonight, but I want to give you guys packed value. Uh, Eric Danike says, how do I become the expert in my area when there already is one? And in brackets says from KW. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Patrick says, how do I become an expert in my area if there already is one, AKA me, the fruitful investor? You're in Kitchener. Very, very cool. Let's link up. No problem. So I want you to be an, uh, an expert in the terms of knowing your comps, knowing the values, knowing the rents, et cetera, but what you really wanna lean on, I like to act out things, I don't know why. You wanna lean on your expert specialized realtor. So this is a perfect plug, man. Thank you for the plug that I am a realtor specializing solely with real estate investors in Kitchener, okay? So you guys need realtors like me. I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna brag, yay me. You need a realtor like me who specializes only with investors. Now you wanna lean on them because they know everything. They got the team, they're doing this full time, they know the rents, they know the values already, and by you hanging out with them and buying properties with them, you're gonna become the expert real soon, it's gonna rub off. You're gonna start knowing what the values are, et cetera, et cetera. So most important person on your team, uh, again, I'm just gonna plug myself, is a specialized realtor, the most important team member, and you gotta be working with them. Don't be working with the Joes, or what's a girl name for a Joe? We got like a Joe for a guy, but like a Jane? Yeah, Jane. Don't be working with the Joes and Janes, bro who like sell white home or homes to the white picket fence and they're like, hey, I can sell you investment properties and like, how many properties do you have, Jane? She's like, nine, don't work with her, okay? We wanna work with the pros. <laughs> so anyway, that's the answer to your question. Work with the pros who are specialists 
and it will rub off. You will learn a ton more than working with Joe and Jane. Next question. Uh, Dave says, how do you recommend one to start with little hard money? What was the question? How do you, how do you start? How do you, how do you recommend one to start with little hard money? Okay. The question was, how do you start investing in real estate with little to no hard money? Um, I don't know. It's a tough question, man. <laughs> What you guys want to do is start, again, I'm, I sound like a broken record, but guys, man, it, it works. You want to start with the buy and holds, which won't let you use the buy, the, sorry, the private money. They won't let you because you need uh, to show where the funds came from in order to buy long term. But I, know, I think I know where you're kind of getting at. You will probably want to do flips. And if you have little to no hard money, I'm assuming you're newer. I'm just assuming. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section so I can answer your question better. If you're newer, don't start with flips, please. I know it's cool, I know it's sexy, but please start with the buy and hold, which means you're gonna need your funds to buy. If you don't have that, you need the JV funds who can go on title and do exactly what I said two seconds ago with the 30-70 or the 50-50 split. Start there, build your, your resume, build your net worth. Then you won't have to worry about, uh, here's the point where I'm getting at, you won't have to worry about, do I have little to no hard money? You'll be flooded with hard money when you have one, two, three, Buy and hold, just show them on YouTube, show them on Facebook. I keep hammering this, I know, but it's very, very important to do this. Then the money comes like crazy. It's like waterfalls. You can't, I have so much money being thrown at me, I don't know what to do with it, honestly. It sounds like such a dick thing to say. That's the, that's the position I'm in. I have too much money and not enough deals, which is why I'm doing all the flyering and stuff to get the damn deals so I can buy more houses. That's the point you want to get to. It's a good problem to have. Now, you're, you're not going to get there owning one or two properties. You got to own 20 plus, right? People only want to work with those they like and trust, which means you have a system in place. So I think I know where you were going with that question. Start with the buy and holds. It'll, everything will take care of itself, I'm telling you. You build a good buy and hold portfolio, everything else falls in perfect place. You won't have to worry about money ever again, right? Now, if, you, if you're like, Matt, I'm not listening to you. I want to flip deals. I don't give a shit. It's my first house. I'm flipping a house. Fuck you. All right, this is what we do. Post on Facebook that you need hard money. You'll get flooded. Even if you have nothing, you're going to get crappy rates and whatever, high interest rates, but at least you're going to get money coming in and you can kind of figure it out from there. You can go to a mortgage broker and ask them to find you private money. But again, you still have to qualify in the, in the, the normal manner. So it's tough. It's tough to invest in real estate when you don't have little to no money, but you got to start somewhere. And it's usually with the buy and holds. I hope I answered it a little bit. Might've been a harsh answer, but it's the truth. I just want to give the truth. So you guys kick ass. Next question. What's the question again? What do you think about buying a lot, building a home oh. on it, and then selling it for profit? Question was, what, what do you think about buying like a vacant land lot and building a home on it and then selling it kind of like a flip? So an entire flip scenario. I've never done it. I know a lot of clients of mine do it. it again, that's something you got to specialize in. Great business model though, fantastic. But I think more of a needle in a haystack because now you got to find a cheap, cheap, super cheap house you can just literally bulldoze, bulldoze over and uh, build something or find an already vacant lot, which is probably not going to be found too much in a city, which means you're going to be on the outskirts of a city, which gets a little more risky. So I'd rather buy like a shitty ass house that's fallen over, bulldoze it, and then build a new house in the city, right? That's going to sell like this. So that's probably what I would recommend. But again, I can't give you any expert value. It's kind of, well, it's flipping like what I'm doing just to the extreme, <laughs> right? Uh, great business model, man. If you want to do that, specialize, own it. I know a lot of people doing that. Why not? Great business. There's a lot of stuff to know about that though. You gotta be like a Terion builder. Um, so you gotta be like a registered builder in a sense. Not too hard to achieve, but it costs money. Everything costs money. And you gotta know, follow the steps and all that. Just more, more stuff. Not putting new floors, paint, kitchen. Any idiot can do that. I'm doing it, obviously, so it's easy. Um, that's why I like that though. But yeah, great business model. Next question. Yeah, long-term strategy, what is my target cap rate? What is my target appreciation rate? So this is a two-part question. The cap rates really only matter with the multis. Um, I spelled multi with an E, classic. All right, so the multis, so six units or more, that's where cap rate becomes a thing. So we don't really use cap rates in single families, duplexes, triplexes, et cetera, because it just won't work. It's not the, it's not the way we do it. We just don't do it. We only appraise properties with cap rates on bigger multi. So anyway, <laughs> the cap rate I'm looking for in my city, okay, it's very specific first. Every area has its own cap rate. The cap rates in my area are gonna be 
garbage compared to Windsor or London, right? So anyway, a, a good cap rate for me in my city is 5%. Now you're probably like, 5%? That's nothing. It's, dude, it's nothing. In Kitchener, if you have a property that's 5%, you're rocking, man. Like that's a sick property. Most multifamilies in Kitchener are 3.54 if you're lucky. So if, if I were to buy a ton of multis, which I really don't, I'd be looking for at least a 5% or what I would do, even if the cap rate was, well, I should do this all the time on triplexes and fourplexes. We buy townhome blocks and then we kick every tenant out. So this is where I'm getting at. So as is, we just bought one like this uh, a couple months ago. It was a triplex, three townhomes. It was three and a half percent as is. Rents were shit. The tenants have been there for like 20 years. Rent was so low. Building was only 3.5%. I knew the cap rate in the area. Remember, cap rate is dictated by the area, right? You don't dictate cap rate. Your realtor or appraiser doesn't dictate cap rate. The area dictates what the cap rate should be, okay? So I knew the area cap rate was 5%, but as is, it was 3.5. So I put the offer in at full price, but Mr. Seller, you gotta kick all the tenants out. I want N11 signs, this is an Ontario thing, which basically means, um, a lease termination by the tenant. So the tenant is terminating the lease, which is what we want, especially now in COVID, but that's, whole, that's a whole other thing. Mr. Seller, I want you to get N11 signed by every single tenant that they're gonna leave, okay? No problem, you gave me full price, thank you for that. He didn't know what I know. I know the air, the air is 5% cap rate. So what I do, I kicked all the tenants out, right? All the tenants, well I didn't kick them out, they chose to left and, and they got paid for it. Mr. Seller paid them I think like three grand per tenant. So they're happy, so they're gone. Now I got this three townhomes empty. I went in, I pimped them all out, I flipped them top to bottom. They were renting for, uh, yeah, like 1100 before I came in, that's too low. Now what are they rented for? 1850, bro, every single one. So I lifted the value back up to a 5% cap rate and the income increased, yo, that was good. That's, that's the kind of things I look at. What was the second part of that question? Cap rates and Cash, yeah, appreciation. Uh, so appreciation is totally different. Um, again, you get that in multifamily and single family, but the, the, the appreciation is more of the single family thing. Um, homes, duplexes, triplexes, that's based more on appreciation. So that's the term for how pretty does it look? What's the color of the floors? What's the color of the walls? Is it a cute little house? That happens more on the appreciation in single family. When it comes to valuing a property in multifamily, the appraiser, the investor, the bank doesn't give a shit what the floor is, what the color on the wall is. They care about the income and the cap rate and that's how they value the price of the property. That was a very quick, this, this is a very deep, this video could be like a half an hour on this alone, but I ain't gonna go that deep. Hope to answer your question a little bit. Next question. Question is, how many refis would you do on a property to get money out and does this affect credit rating? How many, how often should you refi? All the time, as many as you can. As many as you can. Keep pulling that money out. Does it affect credit rating? Not really, because you're just getting a new mortgage on the same house you already got. I guess every time the mortgage broker checks your credit, it takes two points off every time. Who cares, it's nothing. It's not really gonna affect your credit rating, but if you can pull that money like every year, every two years on a property, like just keep doing that, it's amazing. So you can take that money, like you said, and buy other properties, buy more properties. That's the whole game. Pimp out your properties, don't skimp on the renovations, right? That's why I go crazy on the renos, right? You, probably, you guys are probably like, why is he going so crazy on the renos? They look better than my house. Some of them look better than my house. That's the whole point. Why? I'm playing the refi game. I'm playing the valuation game. I want the appraiser to walk through, be like, holy shit. This place is crazy. Nicest house I've seen in three months. Full value, right? That's the gain that you wanna do to get the refi, get the money out, do something else. So yes, refi as often as possible, if it makes sense. Next question. Uh, Kirk Lewis says, how do you screen sellers on the phone to find the motivated sellers with real deals? Question was, how do you screen private sellers on the phone in order to find the real deals? I hope you were here from the very, 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 very beginning when I went over that a little bit, but I'll go over it real quick again. Basically, I'm just, talking to them. I'm just being nice on the phone. I'm asking them very, very, very basic questions. Why are you selling? Where are you gonna move to once, once we buy your house, hopefully? How much work do you think the property needs? 
Um, it's just basic questions. I'm just figuring out their motivation. And then near the end of the phone call, because I know my comps, I know my area so much, <clears throat> I'm gonna give them a price range on the phone, even before I can see the property. That's how you see who's motivated. Because you won't really find motivation that much until you give them a price. Then you'll know right away if they like the price or not. So that, like I said, that's why I give an offer range. Because if I were to just give one price, oh, I could probably pay 400 grand. They're like, what? Neighbor sold for 550. If I say, I'm gonna buy it somewhere between 450 and 435. That's where we're buying a lot of houses right now in your neighborhood. Another thing I say, by the way, I forgot at the beginning. I tell them straight up, look, I'm buying three to four houses a month in your area. And we're buying them all at this price, by the way, between 415, 435. That's where I gotta be for your house. You'll know right away if they're like, oh, okay, why don't you come by? That's motivation. If they agree to that low, soft range, they're motivated as hell. It doesn't matter if they say, oh, why don't you come by? Or, oh my God, please come by. Like, that's motivation, obviously. But if they agree to that price, they're motivated. If they say, dude, that's way too low. My neighbor sold, blah, 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 blah. Don't even go. Sorry, man, you're better off going with a realtor. I know my offer's low. That's where I gotta be. Click, next lead. Like, that's how we do it, right? Hope that answers the question. Next question. Will Alflex says, I have four single family homes. If you were me, where would you go next? Question was, I have four single family homes. If you were me, where would you go next? Why do you gotta go anywhere? It's working, right? Is it working? Your four properties? Triple down. Make it eight, make it 16, make it 32, let's go. I'm pushing you. Why would you leave? Keep it rolling, keep it rolling. Don't go anywhere. If it's working, don't change the system. A lot of people get bored. Sometimes I get bored too. I'm like, this is boring, this is so easy, but I like boring. I trip, dude, <laughs> all my houses look the exact same. My contractors are like, Matt, this is boring. I don't care, dude. Every house looks the exact same. I'm buying the same types of houses over and over. The duplex conversions, I've done like 30 of them now. They're boring, but they're all the same. You want boring. Make your business and your income boring, boring, boring. If you want fun, go jump out of a plane, skydive, go to Hawaii, go to Costa Rica, go to Bali, go travel around, get fun in your life. Real estate, you wanna, we want it to fund your life. You know what I'm saying? So keep it boring, keep it simple, make that money and go have fun in your life. Don't get bored, stay at it. Next question. Is there, question was, is there a wait list for the fruitful investing team to manage the renovations? No, we have a really, really big team. If you're in my area, Kitchener Waterloo, hit me up, man. So what the question is, um, if you guys follow me, when I help people buy a property as a realtor here in Kitchener Waterloo, there's a service add-on where if you want my team and me to personally manage the renovations, I got the crew full time, right? Um, we'll do your house just like mine. Your house is gonna look exactly like my houses. So we'll manage the whole renovation, we'll order all the materials, it's gonna look just like mine. Then when we're done, we give you the keys back, you're on your own, right? So it's kinda of like a half partnership route. You can partner with me and I can do the whole friggin' thing and run the whole business for five years. Awesome, I love doing that, right? There's another service where like, Matt, I wanna partner with you and learn from you, but I don't really wanna like give up 50%. I want a little more, no problem. Let me help you find the property, buy it. I'll manage the renovation, give you the keys back. When it's all nice and pretty, you're on your own after that. Another great service. So if you're in the Kitchener Waterloo area and you have something that you need help with, hit me up. We have a big team and we're always looking for more houses to make look fruitful. Okay, next question. Uh, my tinfoil hat says. My tinfoil hat, I love that name. Cap rate versus cash on cash. Question was from my tinfoil hat. Cap rate versus cash on cash. So totally different valuation. Cap rate up here, right? Let's write it again. Cap rate is a, a valuation tool. It's like an appraisal. It's what appraisers use to value commercial or multifamily properties. So it's, it's more of a valuation formula. Cash on cash return is a return on cash. So if you put in 100 grand and you made 2,000 uh, bucks a year in cash flow, that's I can't do it in my head right here. I need a calculator, but that's what you would calculate to find cash on cash return. So it's more of a return on your, return on your money, whereas cap rate is a uh, valuation tool to value properties. So totally different things. Although the cap rate could uh, also be re return on investment, but it's really more a valuation tool. So totally different things. Both very important. And I actually made a video, when was that? Like a month ago or two months ago? About like what investors need to know 
that was in there. I broke these down in huge detail. So go check that video a couple of videos back. Um, real estate investing terms you need to know. That was a video. So I bust these down a lot in that video. Check that out. Next question. Um, By the way, how long have we been on the call here? It's been like an hour. An hour. All right, guys, we're at the hour mark. So we're going to drop the deal. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> drop the deal. So we're going to drop the free investing deal. I'm going to give you guys a discount on all my courses at the hour mark. Because if you made it this far, you deserve a deal. So let's go well, real quick and then we'll get back in the Q&A. So we got, you guys follow me. I got the reno course. What's in that course? Everything. <laughs> Where I buy all my materials, the, the countertops I use, the flooring, the backsplash, the floor tile, the sinks, the taps, the door hinges. Yeah, we get real specific. The range hood, you get everything. So you're probably looking exactly like mine without me having to manage it. If you want to do everything on your own or if you're not in Kitchener, especially get this course because I show you what I get and where I get it. And by the way, we, if you're in the US, a lot of you guys were like, Matt, I can't buy your stuff in the US. Some is, some aren't. We just changed it, the whole course. There's US links and Canada links. So every product I have has a US link and a Canada link. No excuses anymore. You can get everything I buy. So you get that whole course. You get the unlimited cash, which is my JV course, which is essentially a social media course. Um, so I tell you exactly how to get JVs. Everything I do on a daily basis that me and Tyler do every day. How to make videos, how to write a blog, how to attract a specific person, how to target your ideal JV avatar, which means I'm targeting a very, very specific person, right? All my videos, you guys probably don't even know, I'm like playing mind games on you because I'm attracting you, specifically you, because I know what you guys want. I'm gonna teach you exactly how to do that so the money partners just come in and they're like, they're just giving you money. It's, all, it's almost like they're, they're hypnotized, man. That's how it works. I'm gonna teach you how to hypnotize people essentially with the social media rules. Anyway, I'm gonna teach you how to blow your business up and how to build a brand. What else do we got in that course? We got books. Um, what else do we got in there? I got another course called the 12 Steps uh, to Investing. It's your first steps. Um, we got a lot more stuff coming up. And by the way, the rental course, we're uploading that all the time because I'm changing the styles a little bit. By the way, we're, we're doing a flip right now and that video is going to drop probably in like a month when we're done that flip. We changed the flooring. We're going to put that new flooring in there. We updated all the time, all the new lights, the pendant lights, the lights on the ceiling. Uh, we're updating it all the time. So it's real time. So anyway, this whole value is $888 regularly if you were to buy it um, anytime. The YouTube live people who make it at the hour mark, you guys get all of this for one low price of 347, what was that? 347, so it's a fucking ridiculous deal because this course, the rental course alone is 347, the unlimited cash is 497, uh, the books are free, Some, one is seven bucks, the 12 steps is 37 bucks, anyway, you guys get, and more, there's a ton more stuff in there. You guys get everything I get, I have, for 347. You wanna blow your business up and learn how to do what I do and build a real business? I'm telling you, like everything's in there, 347, Tyler just dropped that in the comment section. When this live is over, the link's gone. You ain't getting it again. If you wait till tomorrow, you're paying the 888 if you want the whole fruitful package. By the way, this is called the fruitful executive package. You wanna be executive, let's go. So check out that chat box, get that course. It's a dirty deal, honestly, dirty. All right, next question. Uh, someone asked, what's the first step you would suggest for someone who wants to try flip? Should I start with something small or should I start with Question was, if I'm starting off on my first flip, should I buy something small or should I partner up with an expert who does flips and then learn from them? Both are, you just answered both. If it's your first one, definitely start with something small if you're on your own. So maybe even like a wholetail, uh, which I should have talked about in that home buying session. So a wholetail is basically like a half reno, like not even like a quarter flip. I just did one actually. So we bought a property. Uh, I, I didn't have the time to do it. We have so many projects on the go, so many flips. Great problem to have. I was like, yo, I can't do this. The, the crew's too booked up. It was like uh, the worst one of the ones that I had going on. Like it was a good deal, but like not a smoking deal like the other ones I had going on. So I just literally closed on it. I cleaned it out and I sold it four days later on the market and it just sold like this. So you can do those. You can go a little farther than that. Maybe you close on it, you paint, you change the floor in like two weeks, you list it again. <clears throat> Excuse me, man, talking too much. Instead of uh, doing like a full on rental like I do, which I would rather do because 
that's guaranteed to work and make me money. But a whole tail is a really great strategy. So like, that's a good strategy for someone who's new to just get in, paint, floor, clean it up, make it look decent and sell on the market. People are always looking for a fixer upper. Because when you sell the market and it's like half done, the general public is like, yo, that's a deal, man. It ain't no deal. They're paying full price on MLS. But to you, it's a deal because you made money. So that's a good easy one. I'll say that's called a wholesale in the industry. It's in between a wholesale and a flip. So wholesale. I don't know. That's what they call it. We'll go with it. Next thing up was, uh, should you partner in JV with an expert to do a flip? Yes, even better. Because, for example, even those who, who sign up with the, the fruitful management where we manage the renovation, or better yet, if they partner with me, you, they learn so much. I had one star uh, partner of mine who we bought a property, I think last April, the first one, learned so much, followed the project of the duplex conversion, learned so much. Four months later, bought another property, which we managed. So he's like slowly stepping out uh, and learning more and more on his own. He learned so much during that. Now he's buying deals on his own and we're, we're finding him more and more deals, right? So yes, leverage the expert for sure. Make some money. This is like a, an apprenticeship program, which is why I love these because you're learning a ton and you're making some sick money, right? And then when you go to do the next flip on your own, maybe you do a quick wholesale or a quick flip, you're ready. You're confident, you've done it before, you're rocking. So that's what we want. So great, either one was a great option. Next question. Um, so this one's for JV Partnerships. Are you sharing cash flow until you sell with the partner? Question was, am I sharing cash flow with the partner that we're doing JV deals with? Yes. So what I do is on our, our duplexes, they cash flow like 300 bucks a month if we're lucky. So we're not pulling 150, 150 each. What are we gonna do with that? We can't party with that, right? So what we do is we have a bank account. For every single property has its own bank account. And that's what you wanna do, right? Keeps things neat and organized. So that 300 bucks just goes right in the account every month, boom. Month three, boom. Month four, boom. We're just putting the money in there. And then when we sell the property three to five years later, we're splitting all the profits. So yes, theoretically, we are splitting the cash flow but we're not drawing from it on a monthly basis because I really like to build a reserve um, in case something does break. The tap breaks, the sink breaks, there's a leaky tap. I, I said that three times. A tenant moves out and there's like a month layover where there's no tenant, no problem. I don't look like an idiot going back to my, my partner and be like, yo, we only have like 50 bucks left in the account. Can you give me another a thousand because you know, the tenant wasn't there? That's a shitty situation to have, but I, I, I do it. But I don't like doing it. So that's why for me, we bank all of the cash every month to build that reserve. So that if it does happen, no problem. I got the money. We can pay for it. I'm not going back to the partner begging for more money. Okay. So that's what I do. Now, if the property was cash flowing like 3,000 bucks a month, it's a big property. Could we do that? Maybe. But I'd probably still be doing the same thing. Just banking it, banking it, banking it, keeping that life simple, keeping it boring. Next question. Question was, when I do do a JV, when I do do, when I do do a JV with a partner, Tyler's gonna make fun of that one on social media. When I do do a JV partner with a partner, what was the question? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Who would decide When I do a JV partner, oh my God. When I do a deal with JV partner, who decides to sell? Basically me, um, but it's very upfront when we do the deal at the beginning that they all know that I'm selling my property between three to five years. Um, that's when I like to sell the JVs. So they know that up front, we have that conversation. There's nothing in the contract, by the way, that's like June 21st, 2023, we're gonna sell it because who knows where the market's gonna be in that point. So there's no like solidified date in the JV agreement that we sign on day one, but they know generally, I plan to sell it between three to five years um, of time. So. Yeah, so I, I basically say, hey, it's a good time. The market's doing really well. We're gonna make probably 75, 80K if we sell it now. What do you think, partner? They're usually like, yeah, man, let's, let's do it. That sounds awesome. That's basically how it works. If you set the expectation at the beginning, there shouldn't be any crazy things at the end. If there are, and they're like, Matt, I don't wanna sell. My dog's coming in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if they're like, Matt, I don't wanna sell. I'm not ready yet. Uh, what they can do is just buy me out and uh, just take over the property completely, which is fine, either one. So yeah, I kind of set the rules of when we're gonna sell and they accept. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Mike says, it's a mindset question. How does a fruitful investor focus on doing product, productive work 
Yeah. Mike Paquette, my man, says, how do, how do I get my mindset right and stay productive on doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing and not the work I shouldn't be doing? I fall in that rut every day. Every day I'm <laughs> slapping myself to get into check. I think the biggest thing is when you are very motivated and you have a, a big purpose um, of what you want in life, it just really makes it easier. I'm also kind of a workaholic in a sense where like I just have a lot of uh, natural ambition and drive to just do what I want to do. But yeah, if you just stay focused on what you want in life, you'll find it's a lot easier and when you're just excited. I'm always excited about real estate. I get super stoked about it. So it just keeps me going. I don't know if I have any, any, any like tricks because I need some tricks, man. You got some tricks? I need some tricks because I'm getting sidetracked all the time, right? But uh, yeah, man, just stay focused, stay motivated, stay excited about what you want to do and it'll just be easier. If you got some tricks, let me know. <laughs> I don't know what to say, man. I, I need some. Some meditation it really helps. Stay focused. What I like to do, I guess I do do some stuff. Again, there's my doo-doo. <laughs> Bad joke, guys. Bad joke. The fruitful investor sucks. I'm here all night. Okay. I visualize. Um, so I do a lot of visualization exercises. I guess that's why I'm so stoked about what I want. Because I put myself, this is going to get real hippie. But when I meditate, I just pretend that I have everything that I want. Like I already have it. And that gets me super excited. So like I pretend like, yo, I'm chilling on the beach right now. I can hear the waves, the sun's on my skin. I'm making 50K a month. Oh, dude, that feels so good. That's what I'm doing. That was a weird story probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what I do, man. It just gets me stoked. It gets me excited. And yeah, I'm getting excited right now, dude. Like that, that, that gave me goosebumps doing that little exercise. That's what I do. I don't know if you're going to find that weird. I love that. And I always tell people to do a visualization exercise. Uh, my desktop is uh, my ideal house in, in the future, right? It's a modern house, like 5,000 square feet, looking over an ocean, all the windows open up, floor to ceiling. Like I know exactly what I want, man. Like I'm super detailed. So I have that on my desktop. I'm like subliminally, if that's a word, seeing it every single day. Uh, I'm going on tropical trips all the time. I'm immersing myself in my dream life. Yeah, man, this got real, real quick, but that's the kind of things that I do to stay motivated. Try them out. Next question. Uh, Thomas says, how do I get financing for more long-term buy and holds? I already have two mortgages to major banks. Question is, how do I get more money, more financing for long-term deals? I'm assuming you're running out of mortgage power is what you're saying. You have two properties, he said. So where people hit the financing walls, where it's called, is usually between two and four properties here in Canada. That's generally where the banks say, no more for you. Joe or Jane. We're going back to Joe and Jane. The more properties you own in Canada, the more the bank sees you as a risk, which makes no sense. You would think that the more real estate you own, the more savvy you are, which you are. But the bank sees you the opposite. They see you as a bigger risk because if you go bankrupt, if you lose your job, now you're going to lose everything. And they have four houses that they're going to get screwed on. Makes no sense. So what I'm getting at is if you can't qualify for mortgages anymore because the banks are saying no, or they're making you jump through an unnecessary amount of You gotta go to the JV routes. Where is that? Nowhere. Okay, I'm gonna add it right here. You, you, you gotta do what I'm doing. You gotta attract JV partners who have the money and have, more importantly, the qualification power to get mortgages. So that's the focus, and that's where you need another plug, the deal in the comment section. Because <laughs> uh, 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 my course, Unlimited Cash, is gonna teach you exactly where you need to go. Because if you're at the financing wall, you got to do what I'm doing. Making the videos, doing the blogs, Instagram posts, Facebook posts. You got to be doing all those things because it's all you got left. So that's what you got to do. Long story short, you got to make yourself a brand and be an expert. Because nobody wants to give money to somebody they don't really know. You got to be an expert and have a website, all that stuff. So that's what we're going to help you out with in that course package for a dirty, dirty deal. Next question. Question was, how do, you, how do I set up my real estate business for tax purposes to favorable tax purposes and write-offs and all that kind of stuff, corporations? Okay, so here's what I do. Um, oh, yeah, I can, I can break it down. All my JVs, my, so at this point, like, who's the last person to ask that question about the mortgages? I want to get their name. So their scenario was 
they're running out of mortgages, right? So they're done qualifying in their own name. So at this point, if you know you're gonna be buying a lot of joint venture properties, or like I have to be because I can't qualify for mortgages anymore, you might as well start a corporation. And this is really the only time I would advise starting a corporation. Everybody's like, yo, Matt, the corporation sounds cool. Should I do that like right away? There's really, in my, this is, by the way, this whole question is way better for an accountant to answer because what do I know really? But my accountant told me what I got to do, so I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Hopefully that helps. Because I'm an off title JV partner, I might as well put all my interest in a corp. Why? The tax rate is much lower in a corporation. Barely, <laughs> though, barely lower in a long term hold. For example, in a long term hold, you can pay capital gains. So you pay 50, you pay tax on 50% of whatever you made. If you made 100 grand, you're going to pay taxes on 50 grand at your normal tax rate if, you, if it's in your personal name. It's very easy. That's how the taxes work. You got to pay the tax man. In a corporation, it's the same thing. You got to pay tax on 50%. So if I make 100K in a long term, I got to pay tax on a 50K. Uh, profit in the corp, it's slightly lower. Like I'm talking like two or three percent lower than the max tax rate at fifty percent. Which in Canada, max tax rate fifty percent is like two hundred thousand, give or take. If you're making two hundred grand a year, you're in the top tax rate, buddy. Welcome to the tax rate. It sucks. So if you sell one property, and for most people, plus your job income, you're pushed into the fifty percent tax rate with just selling one property. This year, for for me, I'm selling eight properties. So like. I'm way over, so I'm gonna get screwed. It's okay though. So in the corp, in the corp though, you pay like 48%, 47, I think it is, top tax rate. So it's better than 50, right? But in the flips, when I do a flip in a corp, it's active income. Now, the active income tax rate in a, in a corp is 15% in Canada and Ontario all day long, no matter what. You make $2 or you make $2 million, it's 15%. Imagine you made $2 million in your personal name. God, man, 50% tax rate, you only walk home with like a million. Well, only a million, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, not cool. You only pay tax on 15% on active. So what I'm getting at is if you know you're, you're, you're going to be buying 10 plus properties in uh, off-title JVs, you might as well make a corporation now. If you're only going to buy like one property a year, like only four properties, just keep them all in your personal name. It's not worth it, it's not worth it. Because I know that if, if you make a corp and you're buying 20 properties with the intention of buying 20 properties, you're gonna be doing a couple flips along the way. I know you will. So you're gonna, you're gonna save a shit ton in the active income category when you're doing flips. I hope to answer the question. I, thought, I think there's a two-parter to that, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was, I think I answered it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, ask again if I didn't, next question. Awesome, man. I love this question. She said, what was your name again? I missed it. Melissa. Melissa. How can I forget? I have an employee named Melissa. Um, Melissa asked, what does my daily life look like? What does my schedule look like? And what do I do uh, business and personal and relationships? Very, very important question. Nobody talks about this stuff. I love talking about this stuff. So today specifically was more than money Monday. If you don't know, I take Mondays off or I try to. Remember how I'm a workaholic? I can't stop, man, but I try. So Mondays, I try and shut down and I work six days a week full time. That's who I am. On Mondays though, I do kickboxing in the morning. I go to my juice place. I get all my fresh pressed juice for the week. I come home, I relax a little bit. I go in the uh, infrared sauna in the basement. I do a steam sauna, eucalyptus session. Man, I'm just chilling. I'm trying to chill. In between, I'm answering a couple of emails, but I'm trying to shut down. And today, luckily I'm doing more than money, or sorry, a, uh, a live here which is fantastic, which is super stoked. I'm excited for these. But that's how my more than money Mondays look like. The rest of the week is kind of a gong show a little bit. I try to keep it as scheduled as I can. Usually the morning I get up, I make a smoothie every morning. I make a one liter smoothie. That's how the Fruitful Investor rolls. Um, then I go take a walk with Rachel and our dog in the morning. I don't do any work, uh, no emails. I'm trying not to do any emails. I do that first, I relax. I get to work like around nine or 10. Yeah, I know, it's a little late, isn't it? But that's how we roll. Um, yeah, and I just work like the whole day. But the way I do it though, for me, what I found is I work in like two to three hour blocks. So instead of working like a nine to five, where like you're at the job for nine to five, which by the way, nobody works eight hours straight. Like we all know, I've been an employee, right? Like 
you guys aren't working eight hour, eight productive hours. So what I do is I like to work like two to three hours straight on something that I gotta do, like I focus, going back to Mike's question, like how do I get shit done? I just put one thing in focus if I can and just crush it. And then I'll, I'll come down here, I'll relax, I'll watch, I'll catch up on some YouTube stuff, like I'll just waste time. Like I'm not even gonna dance around that. I'm wasting time on social media, guys. Something I'm working on too. I'm looking at, I don't know, skateboard tricks. Like that's what I do, man. <laughs> so I come down, I look at skate tricks for like an hour, I relax, I eat. Then I go back upstairs to my office. I crush another two hours. I come down here. I fuck around for another hour. I go out. I go work out with Rachel in the basement. I go back upstairs. I work. And I do that literally from like 9, 10 a.m. when I start until 9 at night. Like that's, it's like 12 hours, but on and off. That's the way I work. I can't work like eight hours or 12 hours straight. Nobody can. You're, like, you're not getting anything done focused and done well. So that's the way I like to do it. And that's why I'm so thankful to be self-employed. I don't have a boss whipping me. And that's why I set up all my employees, right? My team members, that's what they do as well. I'm sure Tyler does the same stuff, right? He's working in blocks. I'm not whipping him like, yo, you gotta be in the office for nine to five. Like he's doing what he wants. Melissa's doing her thing with the project management. Amar's doing his thing with the acquisitions. Everybody's self-employed on my team, which is why I like it. Cause that's the way I like it. So I'm sure they like it as well. So that's the way we kind of run it. Yeah, that's the way I do it, man. I don't work like nine to five. I work like 24 hours a day if I could, but split up. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Um, Amar is actually wondering what is the power of personal network, friends, and family? Or I guess just how do you feel about that? Yeah, my man Amar is asking, thanks for being on the live, bro. Get some deals. All right, Amar's asking, <laughs> you should be on the phone, Amar. You're my employee. Crack, crack the phone. Okay, yeah, no. <laughs> Embarrassing. Okay. How do you leverage uh, friends and family and investors in your network, okay? So very, very important. Again, you are who you hang out with, straight up. So you wanna be a big baller, you gotta hang out with the big ballers, that's how it works. You wanna chillax and play N64 and play GoldenEye all day? Hang out with those people, right? You are who you hang around with. You've heard the saying before, you are the five most common people you hang around with. Honestly, I find that to be kinda true. If you start hanging out with people who are doing stuff, talking about important things, like to me, I hang out with people who'd like to talk about business, real estate, um, economics, life. Melissa's question earlier about like life and friendships, like that's the shit I love talking about, is the important stuff. When I go to like a party and people talking about like, hey, how's the weather, man? Are you busy at work? I'm like, fuck, dude, get me out of here. Like I hate talking about that stuff. So, so hang around who you wanna be. Who do you wanna be in life, right? You want a six pack? You want to crush out 30 push ups in one go? I don't know. Hang out with those people who can do that or who like doing those things. That's the secret of life. You are who you hang around with. So, leverage if, if you want to be better in life, you need better friends, right? Like when I was going through this as a 20 year old up until now, I didn't lose friends. Like my close friends stayed friends, but we're just different now. We're just different. Like, I don't hang out with, hang out with as much as I used to, obviously. I hang out with people like Tyler who get business and who like business. Like that's who I'm hanging around with. So yeah, leverage your network. And the more you change, your network will automatically change. Automatically. Because if you hang around with losers, I'm not calling them losers like, like they're worthless in life. Nobody's worthless, but they're losing the game of life in my mind. That's, what I, that's how I see it, right? Life is a game to me. Literally, money is a fucking game. It's a video game. This is, a, this is all a giant video game. Now I'm getting real weird. <laughs> That's just the way I view life, man. And yeah, I feel like I'm hacking the game, doing real estate. And I want you guys to do the same because once you get to a point where you're making a ton of money, life gets really fun, man. I'm telling you, the options start opening up. You can do things you never thought possible. Like it's getting, I'm just getting to the point now, 11 years in of grinding 12 hours, split up, like I said. 12 hours a day for like 10 years, I'm finally just seeing the light. I'm seeing that I can do anything I want to do. It's getting real fun. Before I get real deep, next question. <laughs> How long did it take for you to own the first property to reaching uh, 1 million net worth? And if you could start all over again with all the knowledge you have today, yeah. how long do you think it would take? Question was, how long did it take me to get from the first rental property that I bought? I'll draw a little house here. Like a little door and a window. How long till I bought the first property until I had a 1 million net worth, AKA a millionaire. This took, I was 22 when I bought my first one. I was 28 when I became a millionaire. Tyler, do the math, bust out the calculator. 
Six years. <laughs> Six years. Okay, and this, by the way, guys, like I fucked around for so many of those years, not by like wasting time playing N64 Goldeneye, like I said, <laughs> but uh, just doing things that I shouldn't have done that now, like I would never do, right? But like that's not that long, right? Like this is six years of me like kind of knowing what I was doing. And by the way, this was before, right now I'm 31. So this was before YouTube was even a thing. Like nobody was doing these YouTube lives and there's no fucking way I was asking people questions like this. That would have saved me years. Like I, nobody was doing that. So this was six years back in 2012. Is that when I was 22? I think so. Um, yeah, nobody, social media wasn't even a thing really. So I just did my own thing. Like I figured it out on my own pretty much. And a couple people, like at Rain, I joined Real Estate Investment Network. That was the big gun back then, the big uh, investment group. So I went to those meetings, but like I didn't learn too much there um, in terms of like pushing me forward. Anyway, I'm rambling. Six years of kind of figuring it out. Now, second part of the question was, if I know now, would it have been faster? Would have been, this would have been two to three years. Easy. With what, probably honestly less, one year. <laughs> Straight up. Um, and by the way, when I became a, a millionaire at age 28, I didn't even know I was a millionaire. I didn't even know. I, I was just adding up, I think by this point I owned 20 properties, somewhere around 20 properties at 28. Now at 31, we own about 35. But I'm selling a bunch, I'm focusing more on flips. We've done, I don't know, like 20 flips on top of that. But uh, I didn't even know. I just added up all the properties that I own. I subtracted the mortgages. I subtracted the partner payouts. So I added my net worth up, my profit, my theoretical profit if I were to sell everything I had. And I was like, yo, I, was, I had like a 1.1 million net worth. I was like, I'm a millionaire. Like, I didn't even know. And the reason why I'm saying that is because a million dollar net worth today really doesn't mean that much. Like it's, uh, it's super easy to get that. If you're investing in Toronto, you buy two properties, you're a millionaire, right? If you hold them for like three years, like it's, it's easier in some markets than others. But yeah, what I'm getting at, super, super easy to become a millionaire if you just stick to the plan, stay focused, follow a proven, a proven system, which I'm preaching at you guys two times a week here on YouTube. Like I'm telling you guys, every couple of days on YouTube, how to get rich and how to get wealthy. So I hope you're taking the advice because I'm just teaching you exactly what I'm doing every day. I'm just maybe two or three steps ahead of you. Maybe some of you, I'm 10 steps ahead of you. Cool. You want to learn from people like that, right? Who are ahead of you. So yeah, if I knew then what I know now, it would have been so much faster. Little plug, if I would have had the Fruitful Investors courses, you would have been like one year, hit the chat box, get those courses. When this lives up, it's over. Next question. Next question. Is it worth it for an individual to only own one investment property if they're doing it themselves without the help of a real estate investor? I think I understand the question. So like, is it, yeah. is it just worth it to do it by themselves? Is it possible to invest in real estate and be successful if you own only one property? Is that the question? On your own? Yeah. Pretty much? Pretty much. Of course. Why not? How many people in the general public own one property other than their primary residence. Like literally nothing. Actually, I'm gonna do this quick little thing here. What, what is it? I think it's, uh, I, I know this thing. I think it's 2%, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2% of the population own, like I just said, one house other than their primary residence. So one rental property, I should put rental house. Um, half of that, so 1% of the population own four rental houses. Half of that, I don't know these exact numbers, but I heard this and I, it, I think it's real. It's just, it's just purely anecdotal, but I don't doubt it at all. Half a percent own eight or more. And I think it was like, like 0.01 own like 15 properties or more. Anyway, the point is, if you own four rental properties, you're in the top 1%. Congratulations, you made it, right? Like guys, that's what I'm saying. Money is so easy. Going back to the game of life, this game is so easy if you understand the rules of money. Nobody understands the rules of money, honestly, nobody. And it's so easy. You're talking to a guy here, or I'm talking to you, I barely graduated high school, honestly. Like, I, I made a video of my transcript like two years ago on YouTube, check that video out. I, I showed my transcript, I can't remember it now. But in grade 12 math, get this, I got a 52% in grade 12 math which was pretty much a just get the fuck out of my school pass. Like I probably should have failed. <laughs> That's all that was. 
I barely passed grade 12 math. Here I am, a real estate investor. I work with numbers all day, okay? So it's easy to make money and to get in the top 1%. And if you own 15 properties or more, like you're in the top 10th of a percent. It's, that's what I'm getting at anyway. So yeah, if you buy one rental house, you're already in the top two, like you're successful. And if you hold that property for, like I said, 10 years, like dude, you can probably almost retire, depending where the house is, with one house in 10 years of buy and hold. Imagine you had four of those, eight of those, 15 of those. Now we have 35 of those. Like, dude, it's easy. Next question. Uh, do you think the new CMHC rules will affect the real estate market in a positive or negative way? Yeah. Question was, do you think the new CMHC rules will affect the market in a positive or a negative way? So here in Canada, for those in the US, oh, what's theirs called? FHA or something like that? I don't know what yours is called. Um, it's the regulator basically of financing in Canada. They made the rules a lot tougher for first time home buyers to qualify. Do I think it's gonna hurt the market? Some markets, yes, they're gonna get devastated, i.e. Edmonton, uh, Fort McMurray, like you know what I'm talking about, like small, smaller towns, smaller provinces are gonna get smoked, I'm sure. They're already getting smoked. Now they put this in there. Is it gonna affect a Kitchener-Waterloo, a Hamilton, a London, a Toronto? If this was America, it would be the equivalent to a Fort Lauderdale, a uh, Phoenix, Arizona, okay, big, bigger towns, Boston. No, I don't think these rules are gonna affect those mar my market pretty much at all. Like obviously some of the lower first time home buyers are gonna get pushed out of the market and they'll have to rent longer, which is where I'm getting at now. If you're buying buy and hold real estate long-term, is more renters better or less? Easy, dumb question. More. So if more people can't qualify, more people are gonna add to my portfolio here and need to rent. Rents are gonna go up because there's more demand. When rents go up in the multifamily section, cap rates go up and valuation goes up. This is all great. I love it. When these rules came out, I literally was like, yes. Then the flipper part of me was like, shit, a little bit. But the buy and hold part of me loved it. So. Yeah, man, like it, if you're in a good market, like Kitchener, Waterloo, London, Toronto, like I said, Hamilton, not gonna affect the real estate prices, I don't think, at all. It's just gonna push up the rental market even more, which is great. More money, more money. I got the money fingers. All right, next question. What are we at here, like an hour and a half? Uh, yes. All right, we're gonna shut down pretty soon. Get your final questions in. Okay, question was for renters, what lease agreement do I use? Here in Ontario, uh, there's a standardized lease. So that means everybody must use the same lease, period. So it's great. When this first came out, everybody was like, no, I wanna put in all my clauses and do all my thing. I was like, dude, nice, more simple, more boring, fruitful investor style. So there's a standard lease, you can't deviate. What people do do, this is the third do do of the damn life here. What people do do is they add appendices to their leases, which they then put in their custom clauses. Some are allowed, some are not. I don't know any of this stuff really. Why? The property managers find out all, or sorry, they, they uh, get all the leases and the tenants for me, right? So I know if you're starting off, you want to save property management fees, you want to do it yourself. I get it. You got to do, you got to do the leases. For me at this point, I'm trying to build a business. I'm trying to outsource as much as possible so I can spend more time doing what's really important, which is getting money and finding more deals. Everything else I can, I can outsource, I am. So all the property managers do that. I don't even look at the leases, man. They're just like, Matt, this tenant applied, 753 credit score, he works at Toyota, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yo, yeah, sick, sign him up. That's it. <laughs> they do all the leases. So I don't even know what to tell you about like custom clauses. I, I know that they have an appendices that's like 30 pages on top of the 30 page lease. This lease is like 30 pages, it's crazy. Which greatly favors the tenant, by the way. I, I almost made a joke about Socialist Ontario. There, I did it, I did it. Okay, anyway, we're gonna get off that topic. <laughs> so there's a, the leases favor the tenants a ton. So we gotta do what we gotta do to protect ourselves um, a little bit there. So yeah, I don't do any of that. The property managers do. I don't know what to tell you. What I should tell you is, is if you wanna build a business and do this right, you really wanna hire out property managers and 
as many people that can help you out with your business. So I, I understand if you have one or two properties, you want to take care of it, you, you want to outsource those and just do what's important. Like I said, your main job as a real estate investor is to raise money and to find deals, right? That, that, that's what you want to focus on. Next question. Question was, the, the great COVID-19, is it gonna affect real estate, real estate values? Again, this is very similar to the CMHC answer. Again, an Edmonton, a Fort McMurray, St. John's, Newfoundland, is that even in the right province, St. John? They're gonna get hammered a little bit, I would think. Again, a Toronto, a Kitchener, Waterloo, a Hamilton, no. Like I said, the market's on fire, it's crazy. Will, could it affect in the future? Maybe, I hope it does. Now, I don't want to people to get sick and stuff like that, but I hope the market does cool down. That would be fantastic for us, right? I don't think it will, unfortunately. I think it's gonna be on fire. There's too much demand. The economy's still rocking in, this, in a sense of jobs and maybe not right now, but like long-term, it really is. Just a ton of jobs. There will always be a ton of jobs in these key areas I was talking about. I don't really foresee anything. By the way, Interesting stats I learned. I don't know if this is true either. This is also anecdotal, but I, again, I do think it's true. The people who made 10,000 to 40,000 a year uh, at their jobs, these are the people who are gonna get, unfortunately, smoked with, if there's a potential for job, permanent job losses or job restructuring, these people are gonna get hit the most, okay? The, from what I heard, which makes sense. The people who make 40 to 75K a, a year, they tend to be more specialized jobs or more trained jobs, right? These jobs are waiting for them as soon as this is over. Those jobs will be right there back again. I'm talking plumbers, electricians, uh, software designers, accountants, uh, accountant helpers, they're making more than that, <laughs> assistant accountant, etc. Those jobs are gonna be right there waiting for them. The jobs who made 75K, or more, they're not gonna be hit like at all. Cause again, they're super specialized. We're talking engineers, doctors, lawyers, their jobs is gonna be right there. So what I'm saying is these guys who are gonna get hit, they weren't buying houses anyway. They were renters, most likely. These guys were first time home buyers, second time home buyers, they're still gonna buy. And these people are definitely still gonna buy, if not even more. So keep that in mind. Yes, there's a lot of job loss in the news. You're seeing it the headlines. Oh no, right? I get it. It's just the media playing tricks and trying to get fear. That's what the media does. They want to sell stuff, right? Totally understandable. But you want to peel the onion. What's behind the headlines? What's actually happening? These people are the ones losing their jobs and probably going to permanently lose them. They weren't buying houses anyway. Next question. That's what I think is going to happen. We'll see. Question was, this person owns two single family properties in my backyard, Kitchener Waterloo, sweet. Should they switch it up? Should they do uh, duplex conversions? I would say, like I said before, double down on what works. Now you're in my area, so I know what works. Single family properties don't really work anymore. It's super hard to find cash flow uh, because the prices are so high. So the ratio is getting a little like this. So. Again, if you know me, like I did single family properties from age 22 all the way to like age 28, which is only like a couple years ago. So I was doing that full time. And then only recently did the single family properties, like I said, the ratios didn't work anymore. I had to switch to do plus conversions to keep investing because I, I couldn't wait around and wait around for single family deals to pop up because there was no deals. So that's why that, that's the whole reason why I'm still doing do plus conversions now is because I can compete with the idiot buyers. I'm just playing a joke. <laughs> the regular buyers are the idiot buyers throwing all the crazy offers, right? I want this house, 40K over asking, I just wanna live there. So when I convert the property and I change the use, I'm jacking up the value so much that I can play with the general public idiots, in quotations, who are throwing all the crazy offers. I, I can play with them in their say don't. They're just moving in it to live. I'm trying to buy this house to change and jack up the value like 150K. So, like I said, I, I, I can, can compete with them. So that's the only reason why I'm doing duplex conversions. Other than they're like amazing, they cash flow well, they are awesome properties. I'm really only doing them because I have to. 
So if you want to keep investing in Kitchener, hit me up. Your boy is a specialized realtor here in Kitchener. I can help you find the duplex conversions. We're doing like two or three a month between me, my clients, my partners. So this is all we do pretty much full time now is duplex conversions. Happy to help you. But yeah, if your market's getting hot and it's just getting harder to do the certain deal that you want to do, you got to change a little bit. You got to change with the times. Again, real estate investing strategy doesn't change. We're still investing in real estate. Maybe just the way we're investing has to change as the times change and the economic cycles change, the real estate cycles change. That's what we got to do. Two more questions because man, I'm getting tired. <laughs> My feet hurt. Okay. Great question. Dylan's asking, should you buy five plus multifamily properties, um, i.e. commercial, once the banks start saying no to you over in the residential section? Fantastic. Answer is yes. So just the way that I'm doing the JV, the off-title JVs because I can't get any more mortgages, maybe Dylan's like, I don't want to do partnerships with people on single family. I just want to go right to multifamily. Because in the multifamily uh, financing, the banks don't care about you as much. So in residential, the banks care about you, i.e. your credit score, your income, where you work, etc. And then there's the property. So they look at the property second in residential. You first, property second. In commercial or multi, it's the exact opposite. They look at the property first. Does the property cash flow? Is there potential to raise the value? Is Dylan buying it at the right cap rate? He's supposed to be buying it. Everything checks out, cool. Now let's look into Dylan. Does he have a job at least good enough? Like that's honestly how commercial banking works. Commercial financing is way easier to get on a property, but there's a lot more hoops to jump through and a lot more money. Cause you gotta pay for, I can go into hours about this. You gotta pay for the appraisal. You gotta pay for the phase one inspection, possible phase two if needed. You need money. And you gotta pay your mortgage broker instead of them getting paid by the bank. So it's just a more expensive sandbox to get into, but a much easier when the residential bank starts saying you're done. You have four properties, you're out of there. No show, or like I said, do what I'm doing, which is the off title JV agreements on the single family properties, on the duplex conversions, or do the flips like I'm doing with private lenders Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Guys, there's a million different ways to invest in real estate. Just because the banks say no to you doesn't mean the game's over. There's so much potential for you to kick ass in real estate. You just gotta know strategies. Next question. Uh, Last question. What time is it? 8:18. You guys rule. Next, next question. Fruitful home asks, who's your favorite team member? Uh oh, uh oh. The fruitful home just asked, who's my favorite team member? Which is Rachel. By the way. Subscribe to The Fruitful Home. Go in the chat box, click on that, <laughs> subscribe. I'm gonna plug my wife, that's right. Subscribe to Rachel's channel, it's awesome. Who's my favorite team member? I ain't answering that one. I ain't following for the trap. Wait, I ain't falling for the trap. I'm getting tired, guys. <laughs> I love all my team members. They're all amazing. They're all amazing in their own way. I'm gonna skirt that one. Next question. Last question. <laughs> Great, awesome last question. Melissa Lee asked, what's the first step? Building a team before you even find a deal as a first time investor? Or do you find a deal first and then build the team? I'm gonna keep playing with that A. Okay, this is what I would do, team first. Figure out where you wanna buy. I've talked about this in a ton of uh, videos, almost every video really, this slips into there somehow. What makes a good area, number one? GDP growth. Why do we care about GDP growth? Because it leads to job growth. Why do we care about job growth? Because it means that there's population growth because people want to move to a place that has a lot of jobs. What happens when a lot of people move to a place? They need a rental house to live in, my nice beautiful house there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That leads to an increased demand on rental properties which leads to an increased demand on real estate prices, which means our pockets get fat, okay? So that's what we want as real estate investors. So find a team because 
Then your first team member, by the way, is your specialized real estate investor. Again, don't use Joe and Jane, the realtor, on the billboard above Tim Hortons going, I can sell your house in 30 days. We don't give a shit about them. They're not the right fit. We want a specialized realtor that works only or almost only with real estate investors. Why? They know this stuff. The, the Joe Blow realtors don't know this. They just go, oh, the paint looks nice, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want them. When you find the, the realtor, they're gonna have the whole team. And again, the realtor you're working with, like I always say, should have a minimum of 10 properties or more. Why? That realtor is a rock star. Do you wanna work with a rock star? I bet you do. So you need to find a realtor that has at least 10 properties in real estate investing. Why? If they have that many properties, that means they have done a lot of renovations. They probably have contractors they can give to you. They have uh, an investment savvy mortgage broker, the second most important team member on your team. They're gonna have lawyers, they're gonna have accountants. They've built a business and they're gonna pass that business on to you. All my clients guys get like amazing treatment. Like I'm just gonna brag about myself. Like you guys get everything. I'm walking through the properties with you. If, if you need a contractor, like I got it. You won't get my personal team unless we're managing the deal for you or you're my partner. But I got other contracts I can just give to you. Like I got the whole business mapped out for you guys. So I'm giving you everything. The Jane, the Joe, they ain't giving you that. So build the team first because like I said, the realtor is gonna find you the deals. You shouldn't be finding your own deals, honestly. You have no time for that. You should be filming videos, writing blogs, uh, and trying to attract money. Okay, the not so fun stuff. I love making videos and blogs, I find it super fun, but that's literally 80% of your time, guys, should be content. Like, this is 2020, this isn't 1991 anymore. You need to be making content, videos, blogs, podcasts. I'm telling you, it sounds like dumb if you own zero properties. I don't care if you don't have zero properties. I, have, I do coaching sessions with people all the time, and they're like, I, I have zero properties, how can I build authority? Dude, I was doing YouTube when I had one property back in 2012 and people were like, who's this young kid on YouTube? What is YouTube? Like, that I was doing it, man, and it worked. And I was getting partners at age 23, 24, 25, 26. So age doesn't matter and amount of properties would help, but it doesn't matter, okay? 80% of your time is on building your brand, getting your message out, attracting money, so you can tell your realtor, yo, I got the money. The realtor's gonna find you the deal don't be finding your own deals. If you're working with the right team, you don't need to be finding deals. My clients get properties sent to them every day. Melissa, my uh, assistant and project manager, sending you guys, my clients, deals every day. All the numbers are broken down. You, you guys aren't looking for nothing. We'll find the deals for you. We know what to look for. You might not. And even if you did, you don't need the time to do that. You should be doing other things to build your business, okay? So that, that's what I recommend. Long answer because I wanna wrap this video up with a sweet ending. Team member first, they find you the deals, you get the money through the social media and the branding, which Tyler and I can help you with in a ton of different ways. All right, guys, that is the live. Man, what was that, almost two hours? Boom, two hours. that's sick. Hope you guys learned anything. If you like this live, smash that like button so I know you guys like it, and we're gonna do more. Tyler's getting the uh, ending wrapped up here pretty soon, the last video, because you guys have 10 minutes left to get the deal, the deal, the fruitful deal in the comment section. All my courses, dude, all my courses for 347. Dirty, you guys are stealing from me. I don't know if we should do that anymore, dude. Way too low, way too low. Maybe next time we'll raise it up. Get that deal, because I'm gonna rethink it in a couple minutes here. Maybe we won't do it again. All right, get that deal. Hope you guys like this live. I will see you in four weeks from now. We'll do this again. I'll have you kick some butt. Yo, hit that outro video. Are we there? From the number one station, this is a story about love. A love story. <laughs>
a treasure from the tree right from the tree my body ain't confused no more do you hear that i'm looking at the sky see the spark and singing Wait. i've been waiting for a sign move your feet From the number one station, this is a story about love, a love story. Yeah. 
treasure from the tree. Music is mine to give. 